Uh, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kevin. I'm one of the event hosts here at Powell's Books. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events and live events by visiting our website at powells.com. If you don't already do so, please follow us on social medias, uh, Twitter and Facebook, Instagram as well, as well as our YouTube channel. Tonight, we're excited to host Aaron Gleason in conversation with Gabrielle Langholz. For years, Forest Feast fans have loved Aaron Gleason's effortless California-style vegetarian cooking made in her beautiful cabin in the woods. Now Gleason takes an extended road trip around California, staying in unique cabin dwellings along the way and showing readers the beauty and incredible food of the Golden State that she knows so well. From the grapes of wine country where Gleason grew up to the avocados of San Diego, California is known for its rich agriculture. The Forest Feast Road Trip showcases 100 vegetarian recipes, all inspired by her family's journey by car through a stunningly geographically diverse setting. Each beautiful chapter focuses on a different region of California, depicted in Gleason's signature aesthetic of atmospheric photography, watercolor illustrations, and mouthwatering recipes drawn from the fresh local produce found in each location. Gleason visits Mendocino, Joshua Tree, Lake Tahoe, the beaches of Santa Barbara, Yosemite National Park, and everywhere in between. In each location, Gleason and her family stay in design forward cabins, host dinner parties, and explore local attractions, providing tips for you, the reader, who may want to take a California trip of your own. Erin is joining us tonight from Woodside, California. And Gleason will be joined in conversation by Gabrielle Longholtz, author of many books, including the wonderful United States, United Tastes of America. She's joining us from New Hope, Pennsylvania. This evening's event also includes an audience Q&A. You can use that Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question at any time. And if someone has typed a question that you'd like to know the answer to, you can even upvote that particular question. And perhaps most importantly, please support Aaron and Powell's by purchasing copies of The Forest Feast Road Trip from us. A link to buy that book as well as a link to Aaron's other books and Gabrielle's books will be shared in the chat a couple of times this evening. Aaron, Gabrielle, we're so excited to have you both with us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Gabrielle, for being here with me. <laughs> this is Hi, so Erin. <laughs> Congratulations on your new book. I cannot believe, what number is this? I can't even count how many. How many Forest Beast wow. books do you have now? Number five, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, it's so beautiful. Well, first of all, you and I met in New York City, I think. We Brooklyn did. Brooklyn in Brooklyn. Yeah. Yep. And you're my editor. Now you're I What'd you say? Is that how we first got connected? You were my editor at Edible Manhattan in Brooklyn. Yeah, I was trying to remember. Food and different things for those magazines. Gorgeous photography. I think maybe Michael Harlan Turkel introduced us. I yeah. saw his I saw his vinegar book on, on the back, shelf in the background in one of your pictures. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's in there. <laughs> That's a trip. So it's been a while since uh, we've seen each other in person, but I love all, everything you're doing and you've written so many cookbooks since I saw you last. <laughs> we're here to talk about you. So how did you end up, we were in Brooklyn, how did you end up like standing those magnificent redwoods and creating the Forest Feast? Yeah, so uh, after college, I moved to New York and I just, I went there because I wanted to become a photographer. I didn't really know what that meant, but I knew I loved photography and wanted to try and give a go at it. And um, I did a lot of different like unpaid internships. I worked at a magazine and for different photographers in their studios. And I babysat and walked dogs and worked at a restaurant and did a million other things to try and do it all um, and sort of make the creative you know career happen in New York. Um, and then I ended up going back to school for photography. I did an MFA at School of Visual Arts. And then that's really when I started shooting food. And my thesis project was kind of like an art book cookbook um, with chef Will Goldfarb. 
um, at his pastry restaurant, Room for Dessert in Soho. Um, and I think that's when I first really kind of got into shooting food. I was volunteering a lot at the James Beard Foundation. They had volunteer photographers at all their dinners. I don't know, they, they probably haven't been going for a while, but I think they still do. And um, I just started to meet chefs in New York and then try to create a kind of portfolio of food. And um, after almost 10 years in New York, John got a job and my husband got a job in California, which brought us west. But also we, we chose that because my family's out here in Sonoma County. We're a couple of hours um, south of there. We're uh, in the northern Santa Cruz Mountains, but sort of not far from Palo Alto, California. But um, just by chance, I didn't know the area at all, but by chance we found this little cabin in the woods for rent. <laughs> and it was like from Brooklyn to the woods, complete 180. We just sort of, you know, we weren't, we had just gotten married. We didn't have any kids yet. And we just thought it would be like a fun little adventure. And I never imagined that it would kind of turn my career in a new direction. I was, when we got here, I was hoping to shoot other people's cookbooks. Um, and I actually assisted Michael Harlan Turkel um, on a cookbook shoot in San Francisco when I first arrived. Um, and I had been doing all kind of like studio lit type work and he was shooting entirely with natural light, which was kind of like revolutionary for me to, to watch a whole shoot of just window light. <laughs> um, and so I came back to the cabin and started shooting all outdoors on our deck in the Redwoods. And there's a lot of fog here, which makes for kind of like a big soft box in the sky. Um, and I just started taking photos that I would put on a blog. I started a new blog. I called it the forest feast because I was living in the forest and cooking up a feast. This is the first time I hadn't, um, I wasn't working with chefs who made the food. I didn't know anybody. <laughs> so I started making things myself from our farm box, our CSA farm box that was coming weekly. Um, and so very, very simple dishes because I'm very much a home cook. Um, but those are the photos that I was taking and posting and the blog sort of started to pick up and gain um, a readership. And within about uh, a year, I had a book deal. A, a literary agent reached out to me, kind of like cold called, said, I saw your blog. I think you should turn it into a book. And I remember I called you, Gabrielle. I don't know. I remember, remember I remember talking to you on the phone about it. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm not ready for this. I don't know like what to do. Like, I, I can't like make a cookbook like I'm a home cook and I've never done this before like I felt like I was very much in the beginning part of my career and I didn't feel like it was my time yet you know I just felt like I wasn't ready but you told me I was ready I remember over the phone you're like you're ready you can do this oh but it my was God. Like TED talks that kind of pushed me forward well your content is so stunning and you're being modest because if I remember I think there was even like a bidding war over your first proposal right there was yes I, I know <laughs> it's a little unusual to happen for a first book and especially like somebody who, you know I don't think any, I didn't it's not like I had a huge blog I don't think people really knew my blog that well but um yes I think because of the sort of unique aesthetic um it was different in the food blogging space I think there's a lot of food bloggers at that time who were getting book deals but mine looked very different um, it's very visual. I can show you what I mean. I yeah, I want to. I want to have you ask. I mean, I do think, not just as a blog, but the content that you create, the whole aesthetic and experience and energy. Yeah, the the concept of the forest beast. Tell tell about it. Yeah. So I think when I started posting these photos on the blog, I. Um, it was very much color driven. I was always looking for like the pretty, you know, the, the most vibrant item in the farm box and kind of working a dish around that, but simple stuff with like often fewer than five ingredients, salads that were like hard to mess up. <laughs> um, and I, I started posting the photos and there's hardly any caption, like sometimes just no caption at all, because I feel like the words do not come naturally to me. The hardest part of making my book each time is writing the two page intro. <laughs> It's like it kills me. Oh my uh, gosh, it's so, is like so easy, but writing an introduction is so hard for me. Your intro is so from the heart and so sincere and moving. So it, it, it seems to really flow. Oh, yeah, right? back to <laughs> um, the aesthetic, though. Um, yeah, so, you know, I was just really focusing on the visuals and always posting two photos. So they kind of always look like this um, it was one photo for the recipe often showing the ingredients so on this page often show the the ingredients that go into it and sort of like a visual diagram of the recipe and then always a finished dish and I don't know if you can tell but this is 
I got tired of my dining room table and I just started walking. I know. You can't bring it closer to the camera, can you? Because it's so spectacular. I want people to see it. And this is your first book you're showing, right? This is the first book, yeah. I recognize it. Um, I was shooting- a couple more pages. I just, I loved how on the left-hand page, and you would do watercolor, right? Yes, so I I kind of like couldn't quite find um, fonts I liked. So I just started using my handwriting. Uh, When I was in New York, I was working at, I was teaching photography at FIT and um, I taught Photoshop. So um, I've always kind of been- into combining my um, my photos with different layers of things. So uh, like in Photoshop, so like this right here is my handwriting up here. Um, and then I do like little watercolor doodles that I was scanning on paper and then putting into the Photoshop layouts. But um, I sort of wanted them to be kind of like visual diagrams um, that are really easy to look at um things that you can just sort of glance at and say oh I have that in my cupboard it's not too many ingredients I think I can make it um I feel like the visual oh, okay. nature of it kind of makes it feel um a little bit more approachable I, I feel like, like you know? you're, you've got this incredible Venn diagram of like spectacularly aspirational and also totally attainable and you just my goal yeah. <laughs> But yeah. you make it always seem so simple and your tone and it, it looks like, oh, all I have to do is just chop a few things and maybe I'll put some pomegranates on top and it's so stunning. But the way you present it like on a stump or, oh my gosh, it's so, it's a forest species. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just really got tired of like my dining room table and the tablecloths I had and the fabric napkins I had and um, I just took a plate of acorn squash outside into the woods one day with my camera in one hand and the plate in the other hand I just was looking and looking for like just a different surface and um, there's a, a I think one of the very first shots on the blog is acorn squash which is cut in circles and you know how sort of yellow and brown and kind of autumn colored and there was this big tree that had been taken down because it was dead and there was like a big round surface of a of a tree that had almost the same colors and the shapes and I thought oh those look so good together so I just um put the plate right on that stump and I thought the colors and the 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 shapes and the textures even kind of went so well together and that was kind of the beginning of taking things out into the woods (laughs) and shooting them so like a kale salad on a mossy stump and Um, a quinoa salad on a pile of leaves and just I don't know having fun with it and I think that visually kind of made it look different in the beginning too which made it maybe stand out a little bit that mixed with the watercolor I just I I remember sitting I remember where I was sitting when I first got the the um got your first book in the mail it must have been an advanced copy because you know I knew you and you had had your blog and we had talked about the book coming in my own book my own, I guess, first book was coming. I feel like I like got them both in the same day or something. And yours meant so much more to me. I remember, oh. cry, I remember sitting crying at my oh. It's just so beautiful. And, and obviously you're on your fifth book now, all with this same Forest Beast brand. And you may be too modest, but I want to, I want to ask you like, why do you think it's resonated so much with people? And I'll say like, You live in Silicon Valley. You moved from New York City. It's, you know, we're in postmodern times. Why why do you why do you think it's resonated so much with people? I think it's um, well, people tell me that they they love to kind of just like browse through it because it's so colorful and it feels kind of inspiring, just like the kind of artfulness of it. Um, and then it's different than other cookbooks because it's so visual. But then I think um what kind of makes me the happiest is that people actually cook from it and so so many people have told me that they they actually go back to the recipes over and over I think just because there's so few ingredients and they're so easy to make and um I feel like my job is not to teach people to cook the recipes are so simple and if you want to really learn cooking skills I think there's so many people that do it certainly better than I do but my job is to give people ideas and a starting place and I think my recipes are so simple that people will actually do them and then um, kind of put their own twist on it. So I think um, people tell me all the time, like, oh, I didn't have 
chard. So I used mushrooms instead and it still worked great. So I try to like simplify things enough that you can really kind of put your own creative twist on it. And yeah, I think there's like a sense of, um, I think people kind of feel creative when they're, when they're using it. Like it's, there's a, you know, the, the kind of art in the book and then it's colorful on the plate and um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think though that being in the forest, I mean, you're right there on your patio right now mm -hmm. in the Redwoods, <laughs> your second house in the Redwoods. I'm so yeah. jealous now that you have three kids. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I just think we all live in the, you know, I'm sitting here talking to you on zoom, looking at the same computer I've been looking at since more than 12 hours. And I just think this whole experience of forest and family and nature and community, it's, I mean, I know you're, you're saying, oh, my recipes are simple and delicious, but I think there's so much more to it that, that just inspires, especially in this modern moment, at least for me. But um, I see a question in the chat from my mother. So I feel that I should ask it, which is how are your books different from one another? So you just talked about your, your very first book, which literally made me cry. Um, and now this is your fifth. So maybe tell us about some of the titles along the way and, and then the latest. Yeah. Okay. So the first um, book that I showed you some spreads from um, came out in 2014 and it's, um, really just like veg all my books are vegetarian, but um, it's veg simple vegetarian cooking, uh, very much inspired by our farm box and living in the woods. It's set out um, in chapters by type of food, like appetizers, entrees, etc. cetera. Um, and it's sort of like a little portrait into our world. There's like pictures of the parties and the dinners that we host and cocktail hours on the back deck and um, all pre-kids. <laughs> Um, so then we adapted that book uh, in 2016 uh, for kids after we had our first kid. Um, so that's the four recipes for kids. And it, there's a little bit of overlap. There's some of the recipes from the original book, about half. And then um, the other half is brand new stuff. And we did a bunch of like cooking uh, workshops with kids to sort of get some ideas from them. And it's sort of aimed at kids uh, 8 to 12 uh, who want to use the book themselves and cook. So in theory, they could do it themselves without uh, much, too much help from a grown up. And then um, the next book is a, it's called The Four Sweets Gatherings. It also came out in 2016 and it's all about entertaining. So the, uh, it's still, you know, sort of simple vegetarian, colorful dishes, um, but it's all set up by menus. So it's like a cocktail party menu, a fall dinner party menu, a brunch menu, stuff like that. Um, and then there's like, you know, sprinkled in, there's always like lots of photos of us doing our thing in the, in the woods, <laughs> but it's all still it's very a much- a magical thing. Home. <laughs> I'll tell it's you, I've given so many copies of, of all three of the books you just mentioned and people just love, it's like my, my favorite thing to give. And I've, sometimes I'm like, I know that person. <laughs> so that oh. was the original Forest Feast, Forest yeah. Feast for Kids, Forest Feast Gatherings, which have the most spectacular parties. And then. So those are all based at home. And then we decided to do a travel book. John got um, had a sabbatical and we decided to pitch a book based on the trip that we wanted to take. Um, so we wanted to spend three months in Europe and we chose um, Spain, Italy, France, and Portugal. And the first month was in Barcelona and then we sort of hopped around to a lot of towns and the other places. We stayed at 11 Airbnbs altogether. <laughs> um, but so that was called the Four Seas Mediterranean. And while we were traveling, I took tons of photos and then lots of notes um, on different dishes that we tried and different things we saw growing um, and like ingredients we you know came upon, different flavor combinations. And then I came home and did like some vegetarian versions of dishes I saw, um, some remixes of vegetarian dishes that I saw on menus, things like patatas bravas on, on menus in Barcelona and um, yeah, so just sort of did my own kind of delicious take on those. Um, yeah, but so that was a travel book. And then for the, the most recent book, the, the road trip book, um, the initial idea <laughs> was to um, do, I don't know if I ever told you this, but we, I, we wanted to do another big trip and we thought we would do initially a road trip across America. And someone I know did that book. Gabrielle wrote this book, which is 
um, America, the cookbook. And are we frozen? I think we might be frozen. <laughs> are we back? Anyways, I, so I wish we were frozen. Be able to <laughs> okay, keep going. I can see I'm you. I'm so now. sorry. Just froze. Are we back? No, you're, I can still see you. Okay, okay. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I was just saying that your book is such a masterpiece and such a huge undertaking. And I think when we started to think about the idea of doing a road trip um, throughout America book, it became overwhelming. There are 800 recipes in your book and it's so highly researched. It's just like a huge job. So we pivoted and chose instead of 50 states, just one state, <laughs> my home state of California. And um, so the, the book that I did is not um, kind of like a comprehensive or, or cultural overview um, of the state. Um, it's very much a personal uh, journey. So it's sort of my journal of our family road trip. Um, similar idea to the Mediterranean one of kind of ingredients that we saw along the way, growing on the roadside, farms we visited, wineries we went to, ranches we, we picked things at. And um, I took lots of photos on the road trip and then came back home and kind of came up with recipes that were simple and vegetarian, but kind of inspired by California. Both growing up I love learning that I guess I knew this, but have forgotten that you grew up on an, on an apple orchard in California. Yeah. Is that right? And yeah. So yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I grew up in Sebastopol, California. My parents built their house on an apple orchard in the eighties and it was very bucolic and pretty. And my parents are amazing gardeners and had like a huge vegetable garden. And uh, we were vegetarian, the whole deal. And okay. So what was it like to read explore rediscover you know discover in a new way your own home state I mean that's what I love about that's part of what I love about about your new book is this this math at the beginning and how I don't know it's I, I mean I love your Mediterranean book I love all of your books but the idea of just traveling like travels in your home and exploring date farms and lavender farms and seeing your visiting your family and it all in a minivan oh, so, yeah talk talk about rediscovering <laughs> you know travels at home sort of yeah so um you know I, I grew up here and I thought I know I knew it pretty well my family did a lot of camping and road trips growing up and um but you know, once we did this trip, I realized there was so much of California I had not seen. And John grew up on the East Coast, and there was a lot that he hadn't seen too. So he really came up with the the route that we were going to take for our initial three week road trip. And uh, we started in, um, you know, at home in the Silicon Valley area, Santa Cruz Mountains, and we drove south all the way to LA, and then over into Big Bear, up the Eastern Sierras. Oh, thank you. That's the map that I painted. Um, and then uh, once we went all the way up the, the eastern part of the state through the desert, we went across the top um, into Lassen, which I had never been to. We saw it was beautiful. Um, it had, we saw like snow in July and these amazing emerald lakes. Never been to that whole part. My mom doesn't really like the desert, so I'd kind of never driven up the 395 on the eastern part through the, the eastern Sierras. Um, but we visited Tahoe and also Yosemite over there. Anyways, um, then we continued over across the top of the state. Um, and I just have to say the photos of each one of these places, I don't know if you want to hold any up, but they're oh, so yeah. spectacular. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was kind of a discovery trip. I think I didn't really set out with, apart from an itinerary. Um, oh, yeah, that's near, uh, let's see. That's I love this picnic field. salad in uh, jars to eat on the, you know, I just want to <laughs> live in each one of these spreads. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so after we got over to the, to the coast at Humboldt, like where the giant redwoods are in the northern part of California, we drove all the way back down the one. That's Lassen right there, snow in July. <laughs> um, but I think... Um, you know what was really fun and what's like great about road trips is that you discover so many things along the way it's like you have this idea of how the trip is going to go and then you kind of come upon cool places that you didn't expect to visit um, one of those places was um, a lavender farm in the eastern sierras that um, we we were going to do like two big driving days up the eastern sierras um, and we didn't have a place to stop in the middle we were just going to stay for one night yeah that's it <laughs> And we thought we might stay at a roadside motel or somewhere easy in the middle of the big drive. But um, by chance, like the night before on the map, we found um, that there was a ranch um, 
kind of right where we wanted the stock in Lone Pine, California. We clicked on it and they had a website and it turns out they rented cabins. And so we ended up, they had one available. I called and we stayed there and it was just like this magical stop at this stunning spot. It was like a canyon overlooking the mountains of the desert with this incredible light coming in, a lavender farm, like in the middle of that canyon with this like magical creek river running through it. And this woman who ran the whole show, she kind of created the whole farm. It was amazing. Yeah, but we got to gather eggs from her chickens for breakfast. And I brought home lavender from her farm and ended up cooking with that for one of the recipes in the book. So um, it's a lavender shortbread recipe that's in the dessert section. I just feel like that's how, what'd you say? You just happened upon it. I just feel like that's how every one of these pages is. It's this, this magical experience and serendipity and your kids gathering eggs for breakfast or these slow down kind of moments that are so missing in modern life. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. Yeah, I think people are, are nervous to do like really big road trips with little kids, but we found that they right. were pretty good. They do pretty well in the car. We listened to a ton of kids podcasts. We had little, you know, coloring activities, silly putty, yeah. um, mag doodle, <laughs> some good snacks that don't crumble too much. And, um, and how did you yeah. actually wait before I ask you the next question? I just have to read, can I just pause for just a moment to read you this comment that just came in? Sure. I'm going to have to try not to cry. This woman says that she loved your book so much that she showed your books to the cashier at a grocery store. And the cashier recommended your books to a friend who had anorexia. I'm gonna show you, like I'm gonna cry. And she says, because of your book, the woman with anorexia, her appetite returned for eating. Oh my gosh, amazing with three exclamation marks. I'm not even surprised. I just feel like these people can have such a emotional connection. I feel like emotional right now. Anyway, I had to read you this comment that just came in. Thank you for commenting. With wishes from Canada. So how did you find the places that you ended up staying in? Because I know you've got some beautiful watercolor paintings of them and they're a lot of really fun mid-century modern design. Yeah. So, you know, we stayed in really cool places um, on the Mediterranean trip and I didn't photograph like the interior and the exterior for that trip of the places that we stayed. And I really wanted to do that for this book. And so that's what's different about this book than all the other ones is that I, I featured photos of the places that we stayed. Um, so here's the, did you just show this maybe, but these are the, the illustrations of the 10 places yeah. that we stayed. We stayed in more, but these were 10 favorites. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's a mixture of like Airbnb and Verbo and um, relatives homes and just sort of um, other rent vacation rental sites. That was an A-frame um, in Big Bear that we stayed in. And so I was trying to find, um, I'm gonna put my jacket on because it's getting cold out here. I tried to find um, different places that um, had different types of design. And I wanna stress that, you know, while I feel very privileged to be able to have done this trip, um, the places that we stayed were not uh, super expensive and they were not very extravagant. They were kind of like cabins and one was a yurt. And um, anyways, they were, some of the more expensive places uh, we stayed in were just really big houses. So we went to, you know, we shared them with another family or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, these are not like luxury homes by any means. And I, I think I wanted to take that idea of cooking from a cabin in the woods on the road and see different parts of California through the places that we stayed a little bit. This place that you're showing right now is the Humboldt Bay Social Club, um, which I just love so much, this really cool couple. Um, probably around my age, they have little kids. Um, they bought, I think it might've been an old Navy base or something like that, a Naval base um, near Arcata, California. And it had different structures on it that they totally redid. And we stayed in the ranch house um, and everything's just like beautifully designed and raw wood and gorgeous bathtub. And, <laughs> um, but that was right on the bay, right behind the house um, was water that the kids could play in on the bay, no waves or anything. Um, the town nearby was so cute. So it was really fun to, you know, spend a few days in each of the locations around California, exploring, you know, the farmer's markets and different national parks. And that was Sea Ranch right there. <laughs> um, but it was really fun to, um, just sort of um, 
you know, get to know the different parts of California that maybe I'd driven through but hadn't stayed or spent very much time in. Um, and of course, traveling with kids um, sort of lets you see places in a, a new and different way, which I think is really good. Um, I think it actually opens you up to seeing more than you might otherwise. <laughs> Um, one of my favorite places that we stayed was uh, my aunt and uncle's house in Santa Barbara. It's a place that I um, have spent a lot of time. They moved there, I think, when I was in college, but I went to college at UC Santa Barbara, like right down, like I could ride my bike to their house. <laughs> um, and so that was like, that's like a super special house to me, but it has a, a woman architect and it was, it's a mid-century house um, and it just overlooks um, the ocean and it's just one of my favorite kitchens ever to be in. So it was really fun to go there and spend time with my aunt and uncle and take photos there um, and really kind of like document it for the book. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. I wanted to ask you about the recipe inspiration because so much of this book is about where you stayed and the experiences you had along the way, but then you really seamlessly weave in all these wonderful things to cook and, and eat. So how, tell me about your process and your creative process for that. Yeah, so for coming up with the recipes in this book, it's very much um, just the notes that I took while we were traveling and kind of the ingredients that we passed. So it was a combination of the restaurants that we ate in and dishes that we tried, um, things that we saw growing. So for example, we went to um, a ranch near Santa Barbara and visited my friend Elizabeth and um, she had apricots on her ranch that were ready to be picked. And we picked all these apricots and then the next day um, we were at my aunt and uncle's house and we often make breakfast burritos when we were there and uh, we needed some salsa. And so I thought, oh, why don't we chop up the apricots and add them to the salsa? And so that was just sort of like an on the fly thing, but I took notes on it and then we kind of created it once we got home and that became one of the recipes in the book. Um, yeah, so just sort of a combination of eating at people's houses, eating in restaurants, seeing what was grown and then the farmer's markets, of course, and seeing what was grown all over. And then we still get our kind of weekly farm back. So. Um, for example, like the polenta lasagna, um, that's just something that my aunt was making. Uh, oh yeah, there's the breakfast. I'm just going to show your apricot salsa. This is, oh. I love making peach salsa, but I don't think I've ever made it with apricots. Yeah, it's so good. Now I, will yeah. now I will. But that polenta lasagna, that sounded incredible. Yeah, I think people, that's, you know, people have always asked for vegetarian entrees. And I think that's something that I am always looking for too, like having people over. Um, and wanting like something substantial that feels like an entree, especially if you're serving people who are not vegetarian and wanting to just make it feel like solid, you know? <laughs> so um, the polenta lasagna, I, I had polenta lasagna at my aunt's house around the time that I was like developing the recipes. And I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. Like it's gluten-free also, which is good for guests. And um, anyways, I came home and reworked that idea a little bit with what happened to come in my CSA box that week, which was um, chard and leeks. So I kind of did this big saute of chard and leeks and layered that with the marinara and these like slabs of polenta. Um, I just buy those tubes and then cut them long so that they're kind of like the size of a um, lasagna noodle, you know, and noodle. Uh -huh. the casserole. so it's really simple. And um, yeah, so that was kind of inspired by my aunt and what we had kind of seasonal at that moment. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, oh, maybe I'll just add one more entree. Um, that people have been making on Instagram. I've been loving seeing it. Um, and it's one of my favorites and I've made it for several people like um, dinner parties that we've had over the last like year or so, but it's the walnut enchiladas. And it's certainly not a traditional preparation of enchiladas. It's Yeah, that really surprised me. <laughs> it's not, um, you know, I feel like there's a lot of Mexican food, you know, inspiration in the book because I grew up in California and I it's just California Mexican food is so prevalent everywhere and I love it so much. Um, so there's some kind of like my variations on some favorite dishes, but um, for that one, uh, I feel like to kind of, you know, amp it up the vegetarian entree idea, I added walnuts because driving through the Central Valley in spring, we went um, to Stanislaus National Forest in February and driving through the Central Valley, all the, the nut groves and orchards were in bloom, which is amazing, just almonds and walnuts and everything. And so I came home uh, thinking about different ways to use nuts and added the walnuts uh, to the enchiladas. So it's like black beans and onions and walnuts sort of rolled up, made into a, an enchilada, sort of vegetarian version of it. Yeah. <laughs> Love that one. 
Um, well, you just mentioned Instagram and I wanted to ask you about being a, an author of books I can, hardcover books I can hold in my hand and also living in the woods and embracing slowness and family and also in, engaging with people digitally through, through these modern channels and kind of having a foot in each of those. Yeah, it's, um, <laughs> that's a good question. It's a, it's a challenge, right? To like be constantly documenting um, what you're doing all the time. Um, but I try to just, you know, really share what I feel like is fun um, and what inspires me. I feel like I'm so, so inspired by just the trees. <laughs> like I posted something this morning of the fog. We had this really foggy morning and it's like we wake up and I can see the, the view of the fog kind of rolling between the branches and um, the view is all kind of misty white and things are just starting to bloom. It's early spring when these, these branches behind me are in bloom and our jasmine on the fence right here is just starting to peek out with little pink buds. And it's just like that, those are the kind of slow things that I find inspiring and give me ideas and things that, you know, give me I. It, Sort of ideas of ways to be creative to not only just um i don't know in, in my cooking too but anyways I, I try to look for those moments where i feel inspired and share that so i think that extends both to the book and to social media yeah. i feel um i i don't live in the redwoods but i now live in the woods myself and i feel if I miss either the sunrise or the sunset, I feel so sad. Like I, you know, they're one of each a day and I just I want to be present for them now. So yeah, feel, there is something to that, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think, um, you know, moving here, I think anytime there's contrast, it kind of creates something new for you, right? Like when we moved from Brooklyn to the woods, it was so different that I started to have no idea. Like I thought my life was like, or my career was maybe over, but then it was kind of reborn by contrast, but um, I think there's definitely something about the the calm of being outside, and you know we have a lot of windows so we can see the view, and I think just that like interaction with nature on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, miss city life and seeing different types of people and yeah. being able to walk places and walk to the restaurant and running into people, you yeah. know, on your block and that kind of interaction. Um, uh, I do create it like I'm I'm sort of well I've realized in the last couple of years that I'm a little bit more introverted than I realized because I really enjoy being at home and being alone and I find I think I get sort of like creatively recharged by being solo in nature and that's helped same I always thought I was an extrovert and now I have found out the opposite um <laughs> but now you have three kids too and Tell me about, you know, well, in this case, traveling with kids, going on the road with kids. And I love some of your just tips about like soup is a great thing for a road trip. You can, you know, once you get there, you can reheat it, even if it's a tricky kitchen or you can drink it on the side of a road on a little hike. So I can see, yeah. Tell me about raising, raising little kids <laughs> in, in this way. Yeah, I mean, I think we've always had this kind of philosophy of just like bring them along and just do it. Um, and they're really pretty good. You know, it's like you have fussy kids having tantrums in your front yard. Why not have it be in Yosemite, <laughs> right? It's like kids are hard everywhere, um, but they're also remarkably easy. I think they, you know, they really like the adventure and they like doing new things and they're more kind of um adaptable than we give them credit for i think our kids have learned to sleep in new places and entertain themselves in different ways and um yeah so you know in terms of like feeding kids on the road um you know we ended up doing a lot of restaurants and ordering simple things and um you know they're kind of picky but we packed a lot of snacks and a lot of um you know some of the things that they like we had sort of like a, a, a solid basket of items for the car that we would also bring inside um uh some like like one of the things that i kept in that <laughs> basket of food that we would take inside to each airbnb uh was just like a box of uh just add water pancake mix and it was like a big breakfast of pancakes with like our bottle of agave it's like only two kind of not too large items for the food basket but kind of made um you know 
a Saturday or a Wednesday morning on your road trip feel special and also kind of um, build you up for the day. And so that kind of got that, the idea of simple pancakes got twisted into my pink pancake recipe in the book, where if you have a blender, you just put the pancake mix in there with a beet. There's some beets. I love that one. Pink pancakes. And it gets a little bit more veggies uh, into your kids. But um, there's another recipe, uh, like a, a breakfast sandwich that has grated zucchini in the eggs. And that's another thing that I like to do a lot for the kids. They especially if it's yellow squash, like yellow summer squash, they hardly notice that it's in the eggs. <laughs> but um, yeah. I have to pull out, do you know this book, Olives and Oranges by Sarah Jenkins and Mindy Fox? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a grated zucchini pasta in here that we, we must make like a hundred times a year. Oh, so wow. okay. recommend. That. <laughs> Fun. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think just, um, just do it. <laughs> just take the kids and go. Yeah, Absolutely. Our, when we did like our largest trip, the kids were, um, let's see, two and four. And now they're five, just turned five and seven. And then the baby, the baby, she's almost two. She's going to be two next week. So I don't know. We just keep telling just yeah. keep, you. Know, since she was born, we had to buy a minivan. Love it. I loved your dedication at the front of the book. Tell it. Oh gosh, what does it say? Um, so I dedicated it to Winnie who arrived while making this book. I was pregnant for much of the making of the book with, with Winnie. I was pregnant for that big three week road trip with her. But I said for Winnie, the best and only reason I can think of to buy a minivan. And her little toes in that picture. There's My just... own daughter was like, mom, look at her toes. Um, well, there I love asking you my own questions but there are a couple of questions in the chat okay. um, that I wanted to ask you. Um, let's see. This one says listening from Bainbridge Island, beautiful Bainbridge Island outside of Seattle. Um, although a resident of Palo Alto, I have all of Aaron's books. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Cannot wait to try recipes in the road trip. So glad breakfast recipes are included. Yes, Love your first time I've had breakfast recipes in a book. Yeah. Um, Leslie loves the, your artwork and asks how long did it take to complete the cookbook from beginning to end? Oh, good question. So this one took longer than the others. Um, I like to joke that they're my babies, my other babies, because usually they take about nine months to create um, uh, with about three months of editing. So about a year to create. Um, but this one uh, got extended a little bit just because of pandemic and newborn and no childcare. But um, this one, let's see. Well, I started shooting it really in summer 2019 and it's coming out now. So what is that? A little less than three years? Well, three years. Yeah, usually, so I usually have it for a year and then the publisher has it for a year. So about two years usually, but this one, three years. You just mentioned COVID. I wonder if there are particular kinds of resonances in the current book that, that make sense for traveling close to home and, you know, no airplanes and yeah. little every. Yeah. yeah, I think it, the timing was nice. You know, obviously I didn't know that going into it, but um, certainly for us, it was kind of a respite over the last couple of years to be able to do long weekend trips. Um, we did a good amount, probably six to eight other kind of like uh, long weekend trips to supplement that initial road trip. Um, and much of that was done uh, during the pandemic. So yeah, it certainly felt like a safer way to travel. And mm -hmm. um, I think it will continue to be like that for a while but but even without it I, f I feel like we've kind of learned that we really like it and with three kids it's certainly easier to jump in the car than to to get on a plane so yeah. keep doing it <laughs> love your approach um question here oh here actually let me do this one um could you create an entire cookbook on how to create vegan charcuterie boards please so um from you <laughs> I did not write this question Gabrielle I, I talked about doing a, a board book and then somebody did. It and I was like no Gabrielle I know quite yeah. yes quite a few of them are out now so um okay good idea. I love, I love I love seeing them all and I think you have at least one in here right it's, they're gorgeous they're such a phenomenon now yes I, I want to give any a vegan one is a good idea maybe we should do it Gabrielle um, there is a grazing board in the book, a California grazing board. I think it's the first recipe in the book. Let me see. Um, but 
a vegan book is a, a really good idea. I do have some kind of um, vegetable, yes, thank you. Some vegetable, I guess you can call it charcuterie um, in the Mediterranean book. There is one of those um, where you kind of, I think I had like thinly sliced beets and carrots that were lightly pickled to go on like a um, an appetizer board. But that's a good idea. I, I have not signed on to do another book yet. This is the first time um, where a book is coming out and I haven't signed on to the next one. For each of these, I've always like had the next one in the works already. Um, but I'm taking maybe a little pause. But I think if there was going to be a next one, one of the ones I'm thinking of is a vegan book. So I think that would be fun. People, people ask for vegan recipes a lot. So wow. I mean, a lot of the recipes in my books are, are vegan. Right. But I don't have an exclusively vegan book. So. And I'm not vegan, but I, I mean, we eat a lot of recipes that are vegan. Um, I've got someone here who says they also, this person, Judith, also has all of your books. You've got some super fans here um, who says the visuals and simplicity really inspire. Um, this person asks, now that we are gathering again, um, do you have any suggestions for um, larger groups, 15 to 20 more, and perhaps um, specifically for the Jewish holidays? So obviously this person already knows your wonderful gathers, gatherings books, but any, um, any particular tips for larger parties? Well, so we host a really big Rosh Hashanah every year here with 20, 30, 40 people. <laughs> um, and I, I usually choose, uh, well, we've done it a couple different ways, but I think the key for me has been to, for us, has been to have um, several entrees of the same thing. So like a lasagna, maybe the polenta lasagna, maybe the enchilada, something like that. Um, usually something fall inspired, like I, I have a, um, like a, a squash lasagna in one of the books that we often do. Um, but then either have people bring all the sides or buy the sides at a, like a deli counter. <laughs> with, with, a, with a group that big, it's too, I mean, you just can't cook. I mean, it's hard to cook for 30 people in your kitchen. So make one thing, buy the rest or make it, you know, have people bring sides. Oh, that was something I noticed. I can't remember if it was like a bought pizza dough, but there was something that I re remember noticing that you said, oh, just, you know, you can buy this. And I appreciated how um, I've been, I've been buying some ground coffee lately. Don't tell my former self, but sometimes it's like, I buy ground coffee. Yeah. I mean, I understand how, you know, it's nice to make things from scratch and once in a while I do, but often, I mean, I buy the ground coffee, I buy the pizza dough. <laughs> Oh, I'm not. Um, what'd you say? I'm not a purist that way. <laughs> Me neither. Um, this person asks. Sarah asks. Um, love the shout out to beautiful Lassen National Park. Does your family have recommendations for road trip games, or oh. you mentioned podcasts or audiobooks? Yeah. So, or any other tips about traveling with with children? Yeah. So we um, had a car, like a scavenger hunt card game that was fun. We have like this board that has little flip over license plates, like license plates for each state. Like as you see like Nevada or you see Florida, you like flip it over, it's like a bingo type of game. I get so into the license plate game. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, mean, I think it was like North Dakota. There was some state that was the last state that we hadn't seen yet. We were on a trip to the Grand Canyon and it was very oh. exciting when we... Oh, that's so fun. I love it. Um, so we went to, we actually did drive to the Grand Canyon mid pandemic. And um, one thing that we brought um, as like an activity when you stop for a hike. So we try to like have strategic hike stops or just like when you get there um, is to bring five by seven water pieces of watercolor paper and little watercolor sets. And it was like a fun kind of creative activity to do with the kids when you get out of the car, if you need a little break. <laughs> and then you can mail them as postcards if you're grandparents or whoever <laughs> it's kind of fun but um let's see the circle round podcast really got us through some long some long drives circle round um i think they have hundreds of episodes and i'm pretty sure we've listened to everyone <laughs> um, uh, what else 20 questions <laughs> oh yeah a lot of 20 questions yeah <laughs> i i support 20 questions um, this person asks, is your entire family vegetarian and do you have any tips for between meal snacks, vegetarian snacks? Yes. Yeah, so, um, 
you know, we are vegetarian at home and, uh, but we're not so strict. I mean, I'm vegetarian pretty much all the time. Like once in a while, if we're traveling or if I'm at a home where I'm served something that's special and I want to try it, I will take a bite of something that's not vegetarian. But, um, you know, when we're out and about or traveling, um, we tell the kids they can try whatever they want. If they're like at a birthday party and they're having something that all the kids are eating, it's fine if they want to eat it. Um, so we try not to be like so strict and that's actually how it was in my family growing up too. So like, you know, like I remember like, you know, we were, we could have Thanksgiving on Turkey when we were at my grandparents' house or something like that. So we try not to be so, so restrictive, but we we're certainly vegetarian, um, 99% of the time. But, um, as far as snacks, there's a couple, so there's blender muffins in the book <laughs> that we make probably at least once a week here. I made them so many times throughout the pandemic. It just became our go-to snack. I put three versions of it in here and it, it is originally a recipe by a couple cooks, um, Alex and Sonia Overheiser. They have a website, a couple cooks, and, um, I kind of put my twist on it and added different like ingredient add-ins, but basically you put all the ingredients in a blender and pour it up and you can customize it with like a handful of almost any vegetable. So I usually do spinach, but you can do carrot or squash or anything. So we make those blender muffins. I would say that's our go-to snack. <coughs> yeah. There's also some tahini balls in there. Oh, you found them, good. Um, there's some tahini balls in there that are nut free and a good kind of like vegetarian um, snack to even send to school. Excellent. <laughs> Um, there's a question about what you'd like to add to radicchio salad. Uh, radicchio salad is my single desert island food, and I eat a couple times a week. It week. It then. What did you say? I want to hear what you would put it in, in it then. Uh, okay, well, I, I will tell you. I like a poached egg, feta, scallion, um, vinaigrette. Yeah, that's what I would like to put in a, a radicchio salad. Maybe some, maybe some white grapefruit. The person says cut the bitterness. I'm like, oh yes, I heart bitter greens. She also wrote. So, um, but I, what about you? I'm guessing maybe some dates after this book, or what would you put in? Uh, maybe some blue cheese. Dates and blue cheese. That sounds so good. Yeah, I think I also think of putting citrus with it. Um, we've been getting these cara cara oranges that are kind of pink, pinky flesh, and very sweet. I think that would be good with the the radicchio. Also, the colors are nice together, like the purple radicchio with the nice orange. Maybe some toasted hazelnuts. Oh, yes. I, I do have, I don't know if it's in a book. I can't remember. It might just be on my website, but I have a, um, no, I think it's in Gathering. Um, but like a kind of radicchio. Um, no, I'm sorry. It's endive. Never mind. Never mind. Oh, they're friends. They're friends. <laughs> well, the endives, you know, on leaves, you can um, fill them with things. So sometimes yes. like those things and do like a little, but I, um, I've also done like a grilled radicchio. Yes. Uh, that like on the barbecue with some strawberries also on the barbecue. That can be tasty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of what I love about a radicchio salad too is I feel like you can dress it and then pack it and take it to work and it's, mm -hmm. it, can, yes. it can stand up. Now I like a lot of parsley in there too sometimes. Yeah. Um, that in the jar. yeah, in the jar and eat it on the beach. Yeah. We did well, there. Packed oh, lentil, lentil and grain salads um, in the ice chest when traveling. That became like our go-to thing because it, it lasts a few days. You can put the, the dressing on the side, um, but things like radicchio and um, parsley in there don't wilt or anything and do well. So that would be good. Amen. Um, well, I just feel so inspired to take some trips and try to channel the wonderful energy and inspiration you put into this book. I wish I could come with you. I want so much to meet you on the come beach on. and <laughs> eat one of these lentil salads. I think you should come visit. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. I'll meet you in Big Sur, which I love. Um, well, maybe I'll ask you just as, a, as a, my parting question. I loved, I loved your introduction. It's so crazy to hear you say that the words don't come naturally because they just, they just flow so beautifully. But you ended your introduction with this kind of sentiment about what a road trip can be or mean. So do you have any kind of parting words of wisdom or inspiration about, about embracing the road trips of life? Yeah, I think what I said sort of in the end of the intro was along the lines of, you know, before you leave, I think it sounds like, oh my gosh, like such a long drive, going to be in the car for so many hours. And, 
And I think like the road trip feels very different. Like I don't really like driving in my everyday life, doing the carpool, whatever, but road trips feel very different because you kind of settle in, you've got your podcast, you know, you're going to be there for a while and you almost start to like to get into a little bit of like a, a meditative state, right? It kind of, it's calming and you're, you're listening to what you want to listen to and it's, um, you're on vacation. And I think there's like a different mentality. So I think, I, I hope that, um, I hope people don't get it discouraged to take road trips by the idea of spending a lot of time in the car because I think it can actually kind of be the opposite. It's fun. Well, this book certainly <laughs> inspired me. Get off the highway and stop for hikes and break out your soup in a jar. So beautiful. Well, I, I'm sure this book will inspire many. And I see our friend from Powell's is back. Take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Gabrielle, for being part of this event and asking such great questions. And, and Aaron, it's great to see you and learn more about your book. Uh, I'm going to put a link to the book in the chat one more time there. So I'll go ahead and click on that and you can order it from us. That's what it looks like. Gabrielle has one too. <laughs> um, it's like an art book. It's just so beautiful and the photos are amazing really great and this is uh gabrielle's uh recent book united tastes of america i was looking through that and taking pictures of like some recipes during the talk too so uh, good job gabrielle um i'm gonna post a link to our youtube channel as well and that's in the chat now um, click on that. This event was recorded and will show up uh, sometime tomorrow. So if you have friends that missed it or you want to watch it again, then uh, please visit that page and check out the uh, all the uh, Zoom events that we've had recorded on there. Lots of good ones to see past um, and some more coming up in the future. You can find out more about our events at pals.com backslash events. Aaron, Gabrielle, once again, great to see you and lovely to have you here tonight. And everyone at home, thanks a lot for watching. And from everyone at Powell's, have a great night. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Powell's. And thank you, Gabrielle. Mwah! Thank you all. Thank you, everyone, for supporting Powell's and Aaron. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>